How would life be in Venus? Venus is extremely hot. The planet is completely covered by clouds of greenhouse gases that cause global warming, with average temperatures of 420 degrees Celsius. Its surface does not contain liquid water since H2O behaves as a gas above 100 degrees centigrade. Sunlight does not reach the surface as clouds completely cover the planet, depriving it of solar energy. It sounds impossible that something can live in Venus, but let's have fun theoretically designing a bacterium that is capable of living in Venus. Let's first study some characteristics of terrestrial bacteria that live in extremely high temperatures, let's learn from them to copy some of their abilities and design a heat-resistant bacteria. Bacteria that live at temperatures above 75 degrees Celsius are called extreme thermophiles. The four bacteria that stand out as the most extreme of all are Pyridictium occultum, Pyrolobus fumariae, Methanopyrus candleri, and Geogemma barassii, which has a record of 130 degrees centigrade in an autoclave for one hour, but it is believed that in its natural habitat it could withstand up to 150 degrees centigrade. Remember, that temperature measures the movement of atoms, the more kinetic energy they have, the more they move and the hotter it is, the less they move, the colder. The problem with life at high temperatures is that the molecules move so fast and with so much energy that they behave like molecular bullets that destroy and react with everything they touch. The first obstacle to living on Venus is the stability of ATP. In the laboratory, ATP is hydrolyzed instantly upon reaching 150 degrees Celsius. But cells have certain tricks to increase the stability of their biomolecules. If you increase the proportion of ions and ionic molecules in the cytoplasm such as potassium and phosphate, the vibrations and movement of H2O decrease. Another important biomolecule that is also affected by high temperatures is DNA. The higher the temperature, the more likely that depurination and depurimidination damage will occur. But the cell solves this problem in the same way increasing the proportion of ionic molecules such as potassium, phosphate, ammonium, sulfate and cyclic 2 3 diphosphoglycerate All of these ionic molecules have an antithermal effect on the cell cytoplasm, giving the cell the ability to resist the high chemical reactivity of high temperatures. But depurimidination and depurination are not the only problem for DNA stability, since its complementary strands separate easily at high temperatures. To solve this problem, hyperthermophile cells have a protein called reverse DNA gyrase. This protein supercoils the DNA in a positive direction, and by being supercoiled it prevents the fibers from unfolding spontaneously. Another mechanism that cells use to further protect their genetic material from thermal damage is to entangle their genome in proteins called histones and thus decrease the probability of chemical damage from high temperatures. The histones on the left side are from a mesophyll cell, eight of them bind to form a protein complex that we call nucleosome, and the DNA entangles twice in it. The histones on the right side are from a hyperthermophilic cell, we can see the big difference. Hyperthermophile cells contain histones that form filaments, but instead of a disc, they form a protein complex in the shape of a cylinder and we call it a hypernucleosome in which DNA entangles several times to be better protected from chemical damage and denaturation. But not only DNA is denatured at high temperatures, proteins also tend to denature. Hyperthermophilic bacteria solve this problem by synthesizing proteins with stronger hydrophobic centers and fewer electrostatic interactions with H2O. But the most complicated part in protein synthesis is in the folding process. To solve this problem, the cell produces specialized proteins to help other proteins to fold correctly, and when a protein is denatured they help to return it to its ideal shape. We call these proteins chaperones, they are literally, like a box in which the protein enters, once inside it can finish its folds without colliding with other molecules. On the left side, we see a chaperone protein of mesophyll cells, like ours that live in average temperatures and on the right side a chaperone protein from hyperthermophilic cells. You can see the difference between the two in its structure and mechanism of action. 
The hyperthermophilic thermosome is highly resistant to heat, its activity has been refined to work efficiently at high temperatures and would stop working at normal temperatures. Finally, let's see the cell membrane of hyperthermophilic cells. Unlike mesophyll cells that contain a lipid bilayer, hyperthermophilic cells have a single lipid layer. Hyperthermophilic cells synthesize longer phospholipids that span the entire cell membrane. As we can see, the lipid bilayer loses its integrity with increasing temperature, the phospholipids increasingly lose their attraction to each other and begin to separate little by little until they escape from the cell membrane. But the phospholipids of hyperthermophilic cells remain attracted to each other more strongly and resist their separation at high temperatures. But the bilayer is not the only protection that the cell has, to reinforce its membrane, hyperthermophilic cells contain two protective layers. The first layer is made up of two carbohydrates, N-acetyltalosaminuronic acid, and N-acetylglucosamine. These two carbohydrates form polymers that are connected to each other by peptides, together they form a structure that we call the pseudopeptidoglycan layer. Above this is the second layer composed of proteins anchored to the lipid monolayer, and we call it the paracrystalline layer, or S layer. These proteins connect to each other forming a protective barrier similar to that of chain males. If we see the S layer from above we can see how it is composed of a single type of protein that forms a hexameric quaternary structure, which bind to other hexameric structures forming a symmetrical mosaic-like pattern that completely covers the cell. The proteins that make up the S layer are highly glycosylated, giving them extra protection from high temperatures and they also reduce friction with their surroundings. This S layer is very useful in protecting bacteria from osmotic pressure, damage to the lipid monolayer, and even attacks by viruses. Let's add this hyperthermophilic characteristics to our fictitious bacteria. A lipid monolayer, plus the S layer and the pseudopeptidoglycan layer. A cytoplasm with a dense aqueous solution of ionic molecules. Hypernucleosomes and reverse gyrases to keep DNA intact and thermosomes to correct protein denaturation. The fictional bacterium is taking shape. Now let's think about what type of metabolism is more appropriate. In every metabolism there are three essential characteristics for life to be possible. A source of energy. An electron source and its carbon source. And it is these three characteristics with which organisms are metabolically classified. Now let's just pick the appropriate type of metabolism for the planet Venus. Let's first choose the carbon source. We cannot choose heterotroph because on the surface of Venus there are no organic molecules. But there is enough carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, so let's choose autotroph, like plants. As a source of electrons, we cannot choose organic molecules either. But the soil of Venus is rich in inorganic compounds such as phosphorite stones. So let's choose lithotroph, also like plants. These two were easy to choose, but if we want to choose an energy source, we run into a problem. We cannot choose the molecules, because there are no molecules with molecular bonds that contain useful energy that can survive the high temperatures of Venus. And we cannot choose solar energy either, because the clouds of Venus cover the entire planet. But let's think about some other type of energy in abundance on Venus. What if we engineer a bacterium that can harness the energy from the high temperatures of Venus? Let us remember that the temperature measures the energy with which the atoms and molecules move in the environment. And the molecules of Venus have a lot of kinetic energy. We are going to use this energy source and call it Motus. Another very important factor for life to exist is water. The cell cytoplasm is an aqueous solution and without water the cell cannot carry out the essential chemistry for the functioning of biomolecules. In addition, water is essential to obtain a constant flow of protons that are used to create carbon-hydrogen bonds. But what if the bacteria is able to obtain water and protons from the stones? So the fictional bacteria would have a metabolism classified as motus, litho, auto, troph. With the ability to synthesize its own water from the stones on the surface of Venus. Let's call it Venus Leperem. 
Now let's see the metabolic pathways and molecular mechanisms to carry out these processes. Venus leporem would live in sedimentary stones or phosphorite. They are rocks that contain phosphate and are very rich in other elements that are very useful for the cell. Bacteria would have an extracellular matrix that would facilitate some of their functions. Venus leporem would degrade phosphorite using hydrochloric acid and enzymes in a similar way to osteoclasts when they degrade bone. When the phosphorite compounds are released, phosphoric acid is released, which can be used as a source of electrons and protons. If we reduce two phosphoric acid molecules and remove one electron from each and then join them, we get two electrons, two protons, and one molecule of peroxidophosphoric acid. To carry out this chemical reaction, let's invent a theoretical protein that can carry out phosphoric acid reduction, let's call it phosphoric acid oxidoreductase. But this chemical reaction is endergonic and is not favorable, since it requires energy for it to take place. To obtain the necessary energy, the phosphoric acid oxidoreductase binds to the protein of the paracrystalline layer. Let's call it protein S. Protein S absorbs the kinetic energy from molecules in the surroundings and transfers the energy to phosphoric acid oxidoreductase. But at the same time that it fulfills the function of transferring energy, it also creates a cooling mechanism. The molecules colliding with protein S would lose part of their kinetic energy, and in theory the temperature around the bacterium would be lower than its surroundings, protecting the bacteria from the extreme temperatures of Venus. Now that we have connected the protein phosphoric acid oxidoreductase with an energy source, the endergonic reaction can take place. When two phosphoric acid molecules bind to the protein, it separates an electron from each phosphoric acid and then joins them to complete their bonds, synthesizing a molecule of peroxidophosphoric acid. Two protons escape in their ionic form and begin to move around the outside of the membrane, jumping between the phospholipids. The electrons travel through iron-sulfur centers, each one more electronegative than the last, until reaching a molecule of ubiquinone. When reduced, ubiquinone takes two protons from inside the cell. The reduced ubiquinone binds to a protein that we will call cytochrome L, and passes its electrons to two heme groups. One electron is recycled and binds to another ubiquinone, by releasing its electrons the ubiquinone releases its two protons outside the cell, adding more protons to the proton gradient. The other electron goes to the inner part of the lipid monolayer, where it is received by a protein that we will call ferredoxin L. Ferredoxin L in turn binds to a protein that we will call NAD reductase. NAD reductase binds to NAD molecules and transfers two electrons and two protons to it, to take its reduced form NADH. These proteins are an analog of the electron transport chain, which supply electrons to the cell and at the same time generates a proton gradient on the outside of the lipid monolayer. This proton gradient keeps ATP synthase spinning, providing the cell with a constant source of chemical energy. Let's see the chemical reaction that takes place in the beta subunit of ATP synthase, since it will be of great help to understand other reactions later. The beta subunit contains a magnesium atom in which ADP and phosphate binds. The magnesium atom has a positive charge and this attracts with some force the electrons of the phosphates, discovering the nucleus of the atoms. This is of great help to lower the activation energy in the chemical reaction. In the following animation we will see the molecules in the erwin schrodinger quantum model, instead of the balls and sticks model, and thus be able to better appreciate the enzymatic reactions. In the first step, when the protein changes shape, it moves the amino acid serine to the phosphate and donates a proton to the phosphate. The amino acid serine immediately steals another proton from the phosphate to complete its empty bond, and the protein returns to its original form. At the end of the enzymatic reaction the phosphate's oxygen has three molecular bonds. To return to having two bonds, oxygen donates a proton to the amino acid glutamate. The amino acid glutamate donates the proton back to the phosphate and the oxygen goes back to having three bonds, but now the other proton has nowhere to jump and the bond that ends up breaking is with phosphorus, 
the oxygen molecule escapes as a molecule of H2O. Now the phosphorus atom is left with an empty bond and is directed by electrostatic attraction towards the phosphate of ADP, in order to obtain two electrons and fill its orbital, forming a covalent bond with ADP, becoming an ATP molecule. We have already seen how Venus Leperem obtains energy, electrons, and carbon, but something more important than these three variables is water, and in these chemical reactions no phosphine was produced. Now let's see how Venus Leperem could synthesize its own water from Venus stones, having phosphine as a waste product. In the membrane of Venus Leperem I am going to put some fictitious proteins that form a protein complex that I will call hydrosome. This is composed of six proteins, a phosphoric acid transporter, a phosphoric acid oxidase, a phosphite oxidase, a hypophosphite oxidase, a phosphine oxide oxidase, and a phosphine transporter. These four enzymes that oxidize the phosphoric acid atom are derived from the same gene that encodes ATP synthase but evolved to form proteins that synthesize water and phosphine from phosphoric acid. Part of the phosphoric acid that is released from the phosphorite is taken up by the phosphoric acid transporter protein and is introduced into the cell and is taken up by the protein phosphoric acid oxidase. In the active site there is a magnesium atom and two serine amino acids, from the inside of the cell a molecule of phosphate and NADH bind to the protein. As the first enzymatic reaction, the first amino acid serine steals a proton from the phosphate molecule, and serine donates its other proton back to phosphate, the protein changes shape and the two serine amino acids move away. The oxygen of the phosphate has three bonds and donates one proton to phosphoric acid. Phosphate separates as it is no longer connected to the amino acid serine, and the oxygen of phosphoric acid is left with three bonds, since it cannot donate any of its two protons to another molecule, it ends up breaking its covalent bond with the phosphorus atom, stealing two electrons and leaving it with an empty orbital. The oxygen becomes an H2O molecule, and the phosphorus atom moves towards one of the orbitals of the NADH molecule and steals two electrons and a proton, becoming a phosphite molecule. Phosphite escapes to the next protein, phosphite oxidase, where the same proton exchange occurs, very similar to the previous enzymatic reactions. Where in the end, a H2O molecule is produced and the phosphite molecule advances towards one of the orbitals of the NADH molecule and steals two electrons and a proton, becoming a hypophosphite molecule. The hypophosphite molecule goes to the protein hypophosphite oxidase, where the same exchange of protons occurs ending in another molecule of H2O, and the phosphorus atom steals two electrons and one proton from the NADH molecule, to complete its orbital and become a phosphine oxide molecule. Phosphine oxide is unstable and continuously changes its structure to phosphonous acid and vice versa. Upon entering the protein phosphine oxide oxidase, it binds in the active site, to a serine and a phosphate. The reactions are carried out exchanging protons, ending in another separation of oxygen to form H2O, and the phosphorus atom advances towards one of the orbitals of the NADH molecule and steals two electrons and one proton, becoming a phosphine molecule. Phosphine is transported to the outside by the last protein in the hydrosome as a waste product. These are the enzymatic mechanisms that I came up with to synthesize for molecules of water from a molecule of phosphoric acid, and as waste product, a molecule of phosphine. Comment what you think of the different metabolic pathways that I invented to obtain energy, electrons, and water on the planet Venus, and if you think there may be any bacteria in the universe that evolved to harness the energy of Brownian motion and to synthesize their own water from other molecules.